Hi everyone, it's Anthony here. As you'll know, we've recently come to the end of a series at the Beacon Church looking at the letter of James. Now that we've finished, I thought I'd spend a bit of time reminding us of a few things, but also going over some other things which aren't always possible to include in a message on a Sunday. The first thing I'd like to say is that James himself is more important than we might realise at first glance. Because his letter is at the back end of the New Testament, it might be tempting for us to think that he and his letter are not very significant in the grand scheme of things. In reality, though, James is mentioned by name in the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, as being one of Jesus' brothers. Although, like the rest of the family, he, he struggles to understand what Jesus is up to, that definitely changes quite early on. Speaking about Jesus' resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 7, Paul says, Then he, that's Jesus, appeared to James, then to all the apostles. James not only became a follower of Jesus, though, he became a major figure in the early church. He's portrayed several times in the book of Acts as the first leader of the church in Jerusalem. And so it is the when the leaders in the early church met in Jerusalem to discuss how Jews and Gentiles could live together in the family of God, James was probably chairing the meeting and it was his summary that won the day and a letter was sent out which shows many similarities in style with the letter of James. James is mentioned a few times by Paul in his letter to the Galatians, notably in chapter 2 verse 9 where he's described, uh, along with Peter and John, as being a pillar. James, Kephas, that's Peter, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognised the grace given to me. Obviously James refers to himself at the start of the letter he writes, but he also appears at the start of the letter of Jude. So that's a fair bit of representation which shows something of his significance in the life of the early church. So that's the first thing to say, which is that James himself is more important than we might realise at first glance. And the second thing to say is that his letter is more important than we might realise at first glance. But it's easy to see why we might miss that. Let's think for a moment about the familiar shape of the New Testament. We begin with the four Gospels describing the life, ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus. Then we have the account of some of the early Christian leaders in the book of Acts. And what follows are a load of letters by the Apostle Paul and often, historically at least, Hebrews is coupled with Paul's letters, even though it's not said to be written by Paul. What comes next in the New Testament is a collection of letters, sometimes known as the general letters or the Catholic letters, finishing with the book of Revelation. And James is the first of the seven letters at the end of the New Testament. Early Christians name these Catholic epistles, where Catholic means universal. And the point is that these letters are addressed to all Christians everywhere although 2 John and 3 John are exceptions to that rule. So unlike Paul's letters, which are written to specific churches or specific individuals, these letters appear to be written to a more general audience, hence why they're sometimes called general letters. But there's a tendency for us to relegate these letters to the junk mail of the New Testament, they're what's left over after the really important stuff, the Gospels, Acts and Paul. It's all too easy to see the New Testament as moving from the Gospels, the story of Jesus, to the Acts, the story of the early church, and then to the writings of the one who dominates the second half of the book of Acts, Paul. And then after that, it's the rest of the New Testament, a few short letters from some other guys, and the weird book of Revelation. But as I say, that underestimates the significance of James, the man and his letter, and it underestimates the significance of Jerusalem in the early church. In fact, let's not forget that six of these general letters come from three of the named pillars of the Jerusalem church, as Paul describes them in Galatians 2, and two of them from brothers of Jesus. Actually, it's sometimes suggested that these letters were grouped together because of Paul's comment in Galatians 2 about James, Peter and John 
being pillars of the church. They are letters, in other words, written by those who are at the very forefront of the early Christian movement. People who, unlike Paul, were in live contact with Jesus himself. Now, the ordering of the books in the New Testament, Gospels, Acts, Paul's letters, general letters, Revelation, is due mostly to the use in the Western Church of Jerome's Latin translation of the Bible called the Vulgate. But interestingly, the Greek tradition placed the general letters before Paul's letters, looking something like this. And it's worth exercising our imagination for a few moments and imagining a differently shaped New Testament. In fact, the earliest complete listing of the New Testament books found in the Festal Letter of Athanasius lists what he calls the seven so-called Catholic epistles of the Apostles immediately after the Gospels and Acts. So the order is Gospels, Acts, General Letters, Paul, Revelation, which is still the order preferred by the Russian Orthodox Church. Now, once we're through the story of Jesus and the story of the early church, when the letter of James comes first in the collection of general letters, it doesn't feel as insignificant as it might otherwise. And that order kind of makes sense, gathering together the letters of those, apart from Jude, who are described in the early chapters of Acts, the people who led and shaped the very earliest days of the church, before Paul then came along later. Those letters that were written by people who were widely respected in the early church. And that also reflects the story told in Acts, which begins with the mission to the Jews, headed by these Jerusalem pillars, James, Peter and John, before turning to the Gentile mission, headed by Paul. We know that Paul himself does seem aware of himself as a bit of a latecomer in the early Christian mission. And so these general letters come from those who are eyewitnesses of Jesus. James and Jude were his brothers, of course, but Peter and John in their letters remind their readers that they were there too, that their eyes saw, that their ears heard, that their hands touched. So James himself is more significant than we might at first think. And his letter is more significant than we might at first think. In fact, you might remember we suggested that James was possibly the very first book of the New Testament to have been written, sometime in the mid-40s in the first century. We know that after the stoning of Stephen, persecution broke out in Jerusalem, which scattered Jewish Christians far and wide. And it's highly possible that James writes from the home church in Jerusalem to these Jewish people who'd come to believe in Jesus and who were scattered at this time, exiled, feeling unsettled and disheartened, experiencing difficulties of various kinds. We've been calling it a letter, but in many respects it reads like a sermon or a couple of sermons through which James addresses his brothers and sisters, encouraging them to live wholeheartedly at Christians, as Christians at this time. But let's just remind ourselves one final time of what James says as he writes. We begin in chapter 1 verse 1 with the greetings and then comes the opening statement of three key themes in verses 1 to 11. Just to remind us, in verses 2 to 4, James calls on us to consider it pure joy when we encounter trials of many kinds. So that's the first topic. Then in verses 5 to 8, he introduces us to the theme of wisdom. That's the second topic. And the third theme is introduced in verses 9 to 11, which is riches and poverty and how believers should understand their economic circumstances. And then in verses 12 to 27, it would appear that James goes back through those same three themes, expanding them further, looking at them from slightly different perspectives. So verses 12 to 18 return to the theme of trials, but this time now trials understood in terms of temptations. Verses 19 to 26 then come again to the theme of wisdom by associating it with right speech. And verse 27 returns to the theme of wealth and poverty and economic circumstances. 
Now then, and this I think is lovely, in the main body of the letter, from chapter 2 verse 1 all the way through to chapter 5 verse 18, we can see James expanding on those three themes, but in reverse order to how he's introduced them in chapter 1. So the third theme, riches and poverty, is expanded first of all in chapter 2, uh, in two main parts. In the first half of that chapter, James makes it clear that we mustn't show favouritism to people based on their economic status. And then in the second half of the chapter, that's where he says that faith without works is dead. But here too, he's mainly addressing the problem of a faith which pays no attention to the poor. James 3 verse 1 to 4 verse 12 then unfolds the twin themes of speech and wisdom. So it's this section that begins with a warning about the dangers of the tongue and the end of chapter 3 and into chapter 4 unpacks the theme of wisdom uh, contrasting two types of wisdom and teachings about quarrels and prayer and ending with a call not to slander one another. James 4 verse 13 to 5 verse 18 then returns in different ways to the theme of trials and temptations. James addresses the presumptuousness that causes us to boast and brag and the temptation of doing that and he also has some sharp words on the consequences for the wicked rich who abuse others through their wealth and he goes on to say that Christians can trust that God will judge those who oppress them so they can pray and be patient and he also deals with a common trial physical suffering and illness with the promise again that God responds in prayer and then finally the letter closes with the last two verses now it's important for us to spot that James doesn't create all his pastoral exhortation out of thin air. He draws on scripture itself. Throughout the whole letter, as we've seen, he uses Old Testament law, Old Testament wisdom, and he occasionally sounds like an Old Testament prophet. But brilliantly, shot through the whole letter is reminder after reminder of the teaching of Jesus himself. And James draws on that teaching in a way that shows he's absorbed it and he's able to re-express it in such a way that it addresses the needs of his scattered, persecuted brothers and sisters. Now, if there's one main theme to the letter, it's probably the theme of wholeness or wholeheartedness. In different ways, a number of times, James warns us against being double-minded and he calls us to be mature or complete, whole, in all areas of life. James makes it clear that our faith isn't a hobby. It isn't something we do as well as all the other things that we do in life. It's all our life. It's our whole life. We're to be integrated people whose inner knowledge and outer actions agree, consistent in what we believe and what we do, in how we speak, in the wisdom that we pursue, in the way we treat the poor, in the way we plan our future, in the way we respond to suffering, in our prayer life, and so on and so forth. And it all flows from our faith in a generous God who gives wisdom to those who ask him, the Father of heavenly lights who doesn't change, who gives his people new birth through his word, who's on the side of the poor, who's full of compassion and mercy, who's able to hear prayer and forgive sin. And in all our reflections on this being a faith that works, what we remember is that he is the one who has given us new birth by his word, which has the power to save those who receive it. And our faith flows from that and enables us to follow the path of obedience to God.